Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. We are about to kick off uh, panel three of uh, day one of this second edition of WFS Live. Before we do, though, um, if you happen to have arrived a little bit late today, it's OK. It's day one. We'll, we'll allow it. Um, but don't forget, you can watch any session back on this very swap card platform 24 hours after it was originally broadcast. So that's just there for you to see whenever you'd like. If you've got any friends or other people who want to see what we're doing here, but they haven't signed up, then do direct them to the Live Now Global platform. It's available on all your usual socials, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, also on LinkedIn. And, and they can also see the content that uh, we're putting out here. Plus, it, it, in a week or so's time, we'll put it all on our YouTube channel as well for World Football Summit. So plenty of ways for you to catch up with the content if you don't see it first time around. So on we go then um, with our, our next panel. Uh, admittedly, 2020 has been a, a miserable year for obvious reasons. But let me just point out one way in which has been memorable, which is that We've seen the evolution of a new breed of athlete, a, a person who isn't afraid to speak out, who is aware of his or her role, uh, not just as a sports person, but as someone with profile, influence, and above all, responsibility. Um, and, and also beyond their performance uh, on the field of play, whatever it may be, they're willing uh, to make an impact. E examples abound, but I'm just going to pick three that here in the UK have certainly had an impact. impact. We mentioned one in the first session of the day with, with Jürgen Griesbeck from Common Goal and uh, Jacques-Henri Enroux from, from Olympique Marseille. Marcus Rashford, who of course inspired the campaign uh, to combat child hunger. Uh, Raheem Sterling supporting Black Lives Matter with his own campaign and the message we are tired and Premier League footballers all together um, with the hashtag players together campaign raising funds for the National Health Service here in the UK and the charities that were associated with that in the uh, pandemic. Um, now those are all male uh, role models but of course there are plenty of female role models within um, the same sphere uh, and a couple of key words really emerge here values uh, and education uh, i'm sure that we'll hear more about those uh, and more topics really in this next session entitled more than an athlete raising a voice for the community in partnership with santander we spoke in the last section a session about having uh, women in positions of leadership and that's what we do here at wfs live with our second fully all female panel in succession four super speakers for you and they are the chief inspiration officer vice chair of board of directors at special olympics loretta claiborne a current goalkeeper also involved in uh, sponsorship for the women's team at paris saint germain ariana cristione uh, ceo at sports human rights mary harvey and founder and ceo at voice in sport foundation uh, stephanie strack and to moderate this round table sponsorship manager at uh, grupo santander blanca rodriguez moldes a uh, blanca very very topical theme and a bit of an emerging trend we are seeing with athletes taking more responsibility, I would say. Tell us more. The floor is yours. Totally. Thanks. Thank you so much, David. Uh, thanks also to World Football Summit for giving us the opportunity to, to moderate the panel. Uh, it is the first time we are partners, and it's great to see how the conversation has evolved during these last few editions. I think, uh, obviously, there's always time to talk about sports trends, and which is important in the uncertain time that we are living. But also in each World Football Summit, we are going a bit deeper into real meaning of sports and how important it is for society transformation. And I think this is what we are talking about today, right? And this first day of World Football Summit is all about this. So it's it's great for, for us to be here. I'm, I'm excited to be talking with these four uh, amazing women. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Over to you. Please take it away for the session. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, David. Okay, so yeah, so as I was saying, it is, it is great to talk about how we are, well, we are seeing how sports um, are important for, for society transformation. And that's actually what we what we say at Santander Bank. And, and, and we say that, that we sponsor football because, uh, because we believe it has a capacity to have positive impact in society and, and in people's lives. Uh, as David was saying before, this year it's been pretty awful for, for, for everyone uh, in March and April during the hardest part of, of COVID lockdown when almost everyone in the world was at home. We did see pretty much every agent, teams, athletes, leagues from all sports joining forces against a common enemy. Stadiums uh, offered to be used as hospitals or medical supply centers, uh, donations of meals, money, medical equipment, etc. We all can agree that it was probably one of the first times in recent history that this happened, obviously because the situation was, was also the, the most unusual one. And I think we all know that, that when bad things happen, we all come up together as, as a one. And we are here to talk about today to talk about, about how these type of actions cannot be done 
just around pandemic crisis, but also on a day-to-day -day basis. Communities need everyone uh, to be present at it, making real impact on, on its people's lives. First of all, at a higher level, from companies, uh, brands, for example, for us as, uh, at the bank, uh, this is what we call responsible banking, which is our main road on, on everything we do. Today, more than ever, there is a real need to become a meaningful brand. And I think that's that's the, the higher level, but then it also goes down to to the people, to the people that, that have their own platform to speak up, right? And, and that's why we are here today. And this is the topic now. And, and I, again, personally feel really, really lucky to, to, to be talking with these four inspiring women uh, that we are gonna get to know a little bit better right now. So Loretta Cleburn, Special Olympics Chief Inspiration Officer. No. Hello. Hello. I'm here to talk to you about people with intellectual disability. I happened to be born with an intellectual disability and I was blind. I didn't see it to the age of five and then I went to school and of course it was horrible because of, we always talk about, you know, people being divided. Well, when you're dividing somebody just because they don't learn as fast, uh, you're really dividing a human being. And as I grew up, things were tough. I didn't have no sports. I heard a lot of you talking about professional sport. I'm sorry I didn't do professional sport. But I started running in 1966 with my brother Hank. And then women were told they can't be, participate in sport. I started the track team in my high school. And that was before Title IX. And Title IX came into effect, and I didn't reap any of the benefits. But of course, I joined Special Olympics, and that's when my voice came. I was always told to shut up. We don't want to hear from you. And they use the R word, which is retard. We don't use that anymore. We use intellectual disability. And first of all, we're people first. And when I look back at my life and I think about today, this whole thing with COVID, being a person with intellectual disability, we've been isolated all of our lives. I happen to be a black woman, as you could see. And I seen the barriers of racial injustice. My great grandma was killed during the riots and it still hasn't been brought forth today to solve who done her crime. So when we talk about injustice and racial injustice, and I'm a woman, I was told I can't do this because of being in sport. I remember my days in martial arts. I competed, I traveled and I competed in martial arts and we were always told, oh, there's no place for women here. Well, I defied the odds. I made it a place for me to be there. And now they have women's competition all over the place. Women's football has became huge here. We call it soccer, but it's women's football. It's huge here. I used to play soccer and I love the sport because it brings people together. And that's what sports is about. And when we talk about this whole thing about social isolation, that's not new to somebody like me. If you ask the person with intellectual disability or any other uh, developmental disabilities, we're isolated all the time. So this is nothing new to us. And when I look about doing something, I try to use my voice to help others. And when I talk about going out and doing something for somebody else, I try to defy the odds of being a person with intellectual disability and go out there and do it my own way. I don't need a big foundation. I knit hats for for hospitals, three hospitals now, McGee Women's Hospital. I knit knitted knockers for women who need an uh, insert for their bra, losing their breast to cancer, which is horrible. And I can give back in my own way. God gave me two hands and I use them to give back. And also I am still an athlete. Thanks so much, Loretta. It's always great to, to listen to you. Oh my God. So. Sparring Ariana Christian, PSG current player and sponsorship manager. Thank you so much. Um, can we switch though? I don't really want to go after Loretta. That was super inspiring. <laughs> I can't say much more, be that much more. But um, Loretta, that was amazing. And thank you for paving the way for all women to, to play. And I think it's thank actually you. interesting because we keep talking about social activism or things or what athletes should and shouldn't be doing today. And every woman probably on this panel has been doing this for years because if you're a woman playing sport, you've already been going against what is supposed to have been the norm forever and stepping up and your voice has been actually playing in the game and stepping on the field and doing it, even if you weren't posting on your social media or all the things that have happened today. So until we get fully into that, um, 
I'm really excited to be here. I hope I can share and shed some light on what happens in women's football, especially from a player and the business perspective. And I'm glad to share the stage with all of you amazing women. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Ariana. Next one in line is Mary Harvey, a sports human rights CEO. Hi, Mary. Hi there. Um, so I'm Mary Harvey. I'm the CEO for the Center for Sport and Human Rights, and I am humbled uh, by what uh, you said, Loretta. Um, just uh, what, a, what a great reminder um, about why being an athlete and athlete voice is important and your desire to be heard. Um, even though people told you you can't play, you can't participate, girls can't do that, or people with intellectual disabilities can't do that, and yet you've broken through every barrier put in front of you. So just just inspiring and, and thank you. Um, so the Center for Sport and Human Rights, uh, we focus on how human rights can be protected uh, through sport and also to protect those, um, to ensure that human rights are protected uh, in sport or through sporting events. So uh, my myself, um, I'm a former athlete about 100 years ago. Um, so I used to play for the US women's team uh, from 89 until 96. Uh, I've then held a variety of roles in sports governance, including five years at FIFA. I ran one of the professional leagues. And then prior to uh, taking uh, this role at the center, I worked on the United 2026 bid to bring the World Cup to the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And I wrote the human rights strategy for that. So um, this is a, a wonderful opportunity. There's so much happening in the world of sport and human rights, and particularly this year. And I know we're going to dig into that, but this has absolutely been the year of the athlete. So um, it was last year and it is this year. So I look forward to talking more about that with all of you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mary. And last but not least, Stephanie Strack, founder of Boys in Sport Bees and Boys in Sport Foundation. Hi, Steph. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for, for bringing me on. And it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with these amazing women. I love seeing more leaders in the sports industry that are women. And I'm so proud to be part of this panel. So thank you. Um, my background is a little different. I am from Anchorage, Alaska, which is where I'm calling in from today. Um, this is my hometown. I grew up ski racing and playing soccer and had the amazing honor of going and playing Division I sports. But at that time, when I graduated, there was no professional opportunities for me um, after sports, after college. So it's so amazing to see the progress that we've made. And I started Voice in Sport and Voice in Sport Foundation so that we can continue to accelerate that progress for women in sport. And I'd like to introduce um, Viz or Voice in Sport. Um, it is a new platform for female athletes. And our, our really our focus is trying to elevate the voice of female athletes and give them an opportunity to drive change. We really believe that with a community of female athletes together, there's so much power. And so the idea is to create this community, give them amazing tools to continue to play in sport, but then also advocate for the change we've all been wanting to see. And the Voice in Sport Foundation is really focused on the areas of research that we've for so long forgotten, which is female athlete specific sports science and research. So we'll be doing research on menstruation and sport, breast development and sport, and all of the reasons that we know of why girls fall out of sport at such a young age. Um, so we're really excited uh, to launch both of those companies in the last year. And thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Thanks, Steph. Thanks. And, and also big thanks to special to Mary and to you because you are joining at like 5 a.m. in the morning <laughs> and 4 a.m. It is local time over there. <laughs> That's how much we oh, love football, fine. sports, <laughs> advocacy. Early oh, birds. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. We really appreciate having you here. Uh, okay, perfect. Now the introductions are done. Let's let's go deep into the, the topic and, and talk about what brings us here. Um, first of all, Mary, what we've said is that this year it's been a pretty different one and taking into account what we've seen who do you think is taking the lead into like making change in society from sports when we talk like about sports 
Athletes, no question about it. Athletes are definitely leading the charge. Um, you know, this year has been a strange year, um, but it's been bubbling uh, under the surface for a number of years. And, um, you know, what started back in 1968 uh, has always been there, but um, this year has been an explosion in athlete activism. And let's look at that for a minute. Um, so, you know, when, when the year started, um, and then March happened with, with COVID, um, the center took a, a sharp pivot. And right around the same time, we started to see um, just this increase in athlete activism um, spurred in no small measure by the Black Lives Matter movement, a big, big, important uh, reckoning uh, in the United States. But it started to go around the world. You weren't just seeing um, this happen on sports, uh, in, in on sporting fields in the United States, it was happening in Germany. It was happening in in the United Kingdom. It was happening elsewhere. So it was different this time. And then you're starting to see, um, you know, from Mar Marcus Rashford and the Free Meals campaign, he speaks out. All of a sudden, that program is restored. Um, you've seen really. I wouldn't say an exoneration because that doesn't cut it, but an acknowledgement of Colin Kaepernick's sacrifice. Because now in 2020, people realize that what he was doing and saying back then uh, should have been looked at differently. Um, to Lewis Hamilton and what he's doing in Formula One, you saw an entire league, several leagues, walk out and stop play in the United States after another uh, police shooting. So this is unprecedented in terms of athlete voice. Um, and we at the center uh, have covered extensively an athlete's right to use their voice, freedom of expression. Everybody has it. Um, we've done a webinar where we dove deep into that. Um, and athletes are no different. It is part of their human right to have access to, to, to express themselves freely. There are certain circumstances where in a sports venue, um, it might not be safe to say or do certain things that are provocative and might present a security risk. But other than that, off the field, um, this really has been the year of the athlete and athlete voice. Okay, yeah, totally, totally agree. Ariana, what do you think about, about this? I think a lot of athletes have stepped up and decided to use their voice and their platform for things that they truly believe in. I think it's been great, especially for the Marcus Rash Ash Rashford <laughs> that Mary Harvey brought up was an amazing example, especially too, because he brought up, it doesn't matter your politics, it doesn't matter what you believe, right or left, feeding children is good for everybody. And it's something that everybody's going to say yes to when you bring it to the forefront. So it was an amazing step forward. But again, I think the social activism that is happening now, it's only, it, it's not revolutionary. It's not something that hasn't happened because Colin Kaepernick did many years ago. Women have been fighting for their own personal sacrifices for years. Loretta already discussed the things that she's in for. And I'm interested also from our panelists to understand though, do we think this is because of social media being so popular and people being able to use their voice how and when they want it? that now people are listening or like why is it now all of a sudden that people care because they were at home for so long that they're like oh, okay yeah I, I want to listen to your message because um, it's it's not necessarily completely new it's nothing new that people are, are kind of saying they've been saying it forever it's just been maybe incited or ignited by certain events um so yeah I mean those are <laughs> my feelings yeah no one. maybe I, I agree with you maybe we've seen that like new tools let's not say new like social media it's not new but but in a certain circumstances that we had this year uh, it's been used more and maybe that's something that has actually um intensified like this mm, this at least being active or or is, is that true is that something that that you uh, ladies agree or or like social media having a, a an important role here Well, I think social media definitely has a role, uh, an important role, because, I mean, you can message without without limitation, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, I think there has been a tipping point. I think it got to the point, uh, particularly with the Black Lives, Ladder, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, where enough is enough. I think there was a tipping point. Um, it's been building over many, many years, and it finally spilled over. And there's there's a variety of other things happening in the background. There's rule 50 that the IOC has around athlete 
uh, expression on podiums and things like this. Um, and there have also been high profile cases where athletes who are involved in protest, Belarus, Iran, um, who've paid tremendous prices. So, um, you know, I think it's been building over time. Yeah. Yeah, agree. Okay, I think this is this one is great to to go through the the, the second question, uh, which is Loretta. This this one is for you. Uh, during the time of polarization in the world, uh, what can athletes do to help bring people together and set an example as an athlete and as a member of their community? Uh, do you think also that that this has been intensified by COVID nineteen and how it has exposed injustice? You know, I look at uh, how athletes can come together in their community. We always say, I uh, hear a lot of these folks here, even on this panel saying about big foundations. Our athletes can come together right in their own community, whether it's serving a meal, whether it's uh, doing something for a neighbor. Your community is where you live at. And I know we want to serve across the world. If you have those resources, that's great. But what we tell our athletes with intellectual disability, a lot of them can't leave their community. Their community might be a group home. Their community might be a small area like I live in. I, I live totally independent. I don't have much, but I know I can do something to help my community, whether it's to go out and speak on behalf of people with intellectual disability. With COVID right now, we're not getting the same health care as the average person. So if I had that voice, I want to be able to speak out on behalf of others with intellectual disability here and hopefully far beyond that we have the same rights to whatever is provided in society to people with intellectual disability as the same as for any other athlete. We as athletes have used our voice and I've seen it across course using social media I have seen it through social media where people with intellectual disability are doing great things. And I think the reason why they're doing those great things is because they have that voice. And like I said, my voice was given to me by God, of course, but I could not use my voice at a certain point in my life. It was Special Olympics, someone, some volunteer who said to me, Loretta, you have a voice, you use it. It was my mother, Loretta, you have a voice, you use it. And she meant for me to use it to stand up for my right, but also stand up for somebody else's right, as we, as you see in the day with athletes. And yes, it can be a risk, and I'll be the first one to tell you that. It can be a risk, but you know, I make a sacrifice to make a gain to help somebody else, if it's worth it. Yeah, great, great. Steph, do you, would you add something else to, to, to this? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the world is on pause right now and a lot of sport is on pause. And so it's a remarkable opportunity for, for people, not just athletes, but anyone to step up and use their voice to drive change. And so I think that it's so important right now to really be aware, listen, understand what's happening in the world and step up and take some action. And I do think that COVID has intensified um, the injustices in the world. And it's certainly shown up in the United States. Um, I think it's because a lot of things are on pause that people are able to spend more time reflecting and also listening and watching. And because of that, the, the injustices and the inequalities that we have, I think, always been aware of have just been intensified. And I think you've seen that through racism and supporting Black Lives Matter um, you've seen it in, unfortunately, the access to healthcare with COVID. And all of a sudden, you're starting to see the systemic issues that we have that we need to fight for um, come to the forefront. And I just, you know, I'm so passionate about um, the fact that everybody has a role in driving change. And right now, whether you have a huge following on social media or not, you have an opportunity to make an impact to your community. And I think that that's what's been shown through um, the pandemic. And, you know, from people who have two followers to people who have five million, um, there's something you can do. And that is ultimately, you know, all of our responsibilities. So it's exciting, I think, to see people taking more action 
Um, and COVID has only brought more visibility to the things that we really need to fight for. Totally, totally. Uh, and I think it's it's also interesting to 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 talk about what Loretta said about uh, risks that also when speaking up, we well, we know because I'm not an athlete, but I, I'm talking about you girls. <laughs> uh, we can or athletes can actually take some some risks. So there are risks associated associated to raising your voice. So Ariana, in your experience, athletes who take a stand in the name of social justice uh, take some risks when they use their voice, right? And and what are like do you think that there is an obligation for athletes to to do it to actually speak up uh, what 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 are your thoughts there in my personal opinion i don't think any athlete has an obligation to speak up if that's not what they believe or if that's not their platform or if they don't know where their voice comes from i think as an athlete your obligation is to play your sport or to perform the way you want and i think as any person just like a regular person if you have a platform that you want to use in order for social change because it's something you truly believe in, then I think you should step up and speak. But I don't think just because you're an athlete, you have to step up. I've had a lot of friends in certain situations over the past few months, and they weren't sure how they wanted to use their voice or what they wanted to say. And I don't think that them stepping back and trying to really think about it rather than just jump up and, and start randomly posting or reposting things on their social media in order to be a part of what was happening I don't, I don't think they have to do that. I think it's really something you should believe in and it should come from your core rather than just kind of jumping on a bad wagon because everybody's doing it. Right. So for me, I don't think it's an obligation. I think it's better when it's authentic and people step up and use their voice because it's their voice coming from them and it's what they believe to say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what about the risks, Loretta, that you were mentioning before? What about the risks that are associated to, to speaking up? I know I've faced risks at certain times in my life in both sport and both general life because I would speak up for myself and I would say, hey, I think this is wrong. This is not fair for my athlete friends. Uh, why are we doing it this way? And a lot of times I could feel the tension coming back and sometimes I wouldn't get chosen for something. If I'm playing football or something like that, I had a coach actually uh, turn around and says, oh, well, you won't be able to go to this tournament. And I knew what it was because she was good to me before that, but because I spoke up against something that was happening to my athlete peers. And of course, I always say my health is my wealth. When we were talking about health earlier, that was my slogan. And I said, I think I'm just saying this. I said, I'm, I know, not think I'm just saying this. I know it's not safe for us to be doing that. And of course, I suffered the consequences, but I faithfully believe when God closes one door, he opens another with brighter light. And I didn't speak okay. just for Loretta. I spoke for the team. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think this part of like the risk associated, it's, it's really, really interesting because probably that stops some people to, to actually like speak up and, 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 and bring up their, their voice. So following this question, Steph, what do you think about a uh, women's or minorities, well, speaking up, do you think that it, it is harder from them or for them, or, or it's just, it doesn't matter like if you are part of a minority or, or, or women or what do you think? I, you know, I think this question is tough because I think it can be hard for anyone to step up and potentially put themselves out there and provide their point of view, especially if it's in a situation um, that might, you know, might be uncomfortable. It really depends on the environment, the situation, and who is around the table in any given situation. So I do think you have to look at that. But I, if I if I have to say an answer yes or no, I would say yes <laughs> because women and minorities have an uphill battle already you know, just to get a seat at the table in the sports industry. So I think women are faced with unequal pay. Um, we're faced with a lack of representation in the media and in leadership positions in the sports industry. So when it comes to speaking up on an issue that might be polarizing, I think we inherently face more risk to be heard, <clears throat> more risk to be seen, and more risk to be understood. So I do think, you know, there, there is that for, for women and for minorities. 
However, you know, when you talk about risk, it's so important to look at the situation. Um, you know, the league, the owners of the people that you're that you're maybe protect, particularly talking about, and the makeup of that leadership team that's in front of the athlete that's trying to raise their voice. Okay, and Mary, what do you think about about minorities or women speaking up? Well, there's increased risk for sure, and we've seen it all over the world, um, and athletes in general. Are, are more vulnerable. I mean, we've seen that in Iran with Navid Afkari, an Iranian uh, wrestler who was who was put to death um, for something that he maintains he didn't do, and it was that he took part in a in a pro democracy protest. Um, th there's the basketball player Yelena Lushenka in Belarus who's been imprisoned for taking part in protest. Um, so it goes on and on. But I think I think what's What's really they, they are at greater risk. So I think for the for those who don't have such risks. So I'm going to talk about privilege for a minute. As a white woman, I'm going to talk about privilege, um, and that is um, silence is privilege. So if you have privilege, and that could be defined as you know I could say something about that, but I really don't have to um, because it doesn't affect me directly. Um, that's when you start to get at, well, that's privilege. Um, and silence is privilege. Um, and I think a lot of us who are not minorities um, have learned uh, through the Black Lives Matter protests that it's not okay to do nothing. You're, you, you have a role to play and you need to play it. Now that comes with risk, um, but it can't be at greater risk than those who are minorities who are having this affect them um, that they're going, going through on a daily basis. So it's for everyone um, to step up and, and play a role. So, sorry, can I jump in though? Because I, I actually don't agree yeah. with you, Mary, and I too am a, a white female in, in the sport, but it's some of my friends who are minorities in the sport who are the ones that didn't know what they wanted to say or how they wanted to address the issue and decided to stay silent at certain moments in order to gather their thoughts, in order to decide how they wanted to be represented themselves and how they wanted to speak for a community and they don't want to necessarily be the voice of one community they want to be a part of the team they want different things and so i understand where you're coming from saying that being silent is a privilege but at the same time i don't i think we're going to start putting so much pressure on athletes that they have to take a stand and they have to say if they want to be on the blue team or the pink team or the yellow team or the whatever color team you want to talk about where the focus of athletes needs to be to play their sport and be an example of, of totally agree not having to have a political view not having to have a social activism mm -hmm. like so i think we're going to start to get a little difficult here in in where our athletes like as she said I, I don't think it's an obligation for athletes to step up i think that you need to believe in what you're saying okay so i totally agree um, I think what I'm saying is, is for those of us who, like right now, right, I'm not competing anymore, right? I don't have that same level of risk. I need to speak up. I need to say something. So I, I, comp I think I, I probably didn't communicate it well, um, but but I agree with you. It should, it's athletes who feel that that's their voice and that's what they want to do, but it's their decision. But for those of us who aren't in that position, when someone does speak up, um, I feel an obligation uh, to support them. And that's my decision, but I'm no longer competing. And I totally respect that. Um, you know, people need to earn a living. And it's not, and it's great risk, great risk um, that they do speak up. And so it's, it's more just respecting the fact that they do take that risk. I feel like if an athlete does choose to put themselves out there, as someone who's witnessing that, who's not an athlete anymore, I feel like I need to support that. Yeah, and you know, one of the one of the ways, uh, one of the ways that I also think about that, Ariana, is like the, our athletes have they don't have the obligation, but they have the opportunity, and that's how I always like to talk about it with people on my team at Voice and Sport. Is you have opportunities that other people might not have because of your reach and because of your platform, and so when you're ready, try to use it for good. 
And, and that's always something that is going to take each person their own time at their own pace to get to. And it also might come in so many different forms. It doesn't always have to be social media. Um, you know, it can also be something so different and so much, um, not as visible. Like you can have conversations with your family, with your community. You, you can do a lot of other things than just like get out there and, you know, use your voice on social media. And I think that's often overlooked. No, I mean, I, I definitely agree with those. And I think athletes do their individual things, but I've just, from my perspective and what I see that happens to my teammates or other athletes, they're almost being forced to step up because if they don't, then they're being vilified, vilified like on one side. And even, and it's even for some people who have, might have a different view if they're extremely religious or if they have their own personal views who are also, if they step up because their views slightly different from somebody else, they're getting totally crucified <laughs> on, on social media. And I think this is also a negative too. I think we have to respect the voice of the person as long as they're not hurting other people and athletes have a right to believe in what they believe. And I am a minority. So I know what it's like being a black woman and being in sport. I still compete in some sports, but I know what it feels like when you say privileged and you could sit back and not say anything, but I don't always have that opportunity in some arenas that I'm at that I have the opportunity to sit back and be privileged. I'm gonna speak out if it's against one of my athlete friends, whether they're black or Puerto Rican or whatever, I'm gonna be the one, if I have to be the voice to speak out and protect that person, I will be that voice and take that risk. Well, this and I this do that was... many a time for people with intellectual disability. I'm there to speak out on be on their behalf if they don't have that voice. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't consider I myself think... as privileged. I think this was well the, the most interesting question because it, it made the, the debate uh, so rich i think i think well uh, thanks thanks to, to the four of you i wanna i'm gonna just go to one question that was sent by one of our watchers uh, tamara schindler uh, asked and and this goes to all of you so uh, whomever wants to answer it's it's it'll be it'll be great uh, what should teams and brands be doing to support their athletes and their voices? Listening. Bingo. <laughs> yeah. That's a winner. Bingo. <laughs> yeah. That was easy That's then. I think listening, but also, you know, creating and creating an environment where people feel safe to use their voice and share their stories and share their opinions and their points of view. Because if we don't have those conversations, we're not gonna move forward together. And not everybody's gonna believe in the same thing. And everybody comes from different backgrounds and has different da different difficulties that they're facing. So I do think there is, uh, it's super important to create that environment where you feel like you're, let, you're allowing your athletes to step up and have conversations and share their points of view. And know that if they're doing that, if they're speaking up, think about the risk they're taking in doing so. This isn't risk free for them. A lot's at stake. Um, look at what look at the price Colin Kaepernick's paid and is still paying, um, and, and others. So if they're speaking up, uh, they feel strongly about it, and we need to do a lot of listening. I would also say, don't put the the pressure and lets one person sort of carry the weight of a conversation for everybody. So if you're on a team and you are the only black female soccer player on your team and you're talking about Black Lives Matter, don't put the whole pressure on that one person to speak up and share her story. She might not be ready. I think we all have to be there to support each other and that's really important. Don't put the weight on one, one person on your team and ask yourself, hey, am I creating the right environment there for everyone to have a voice and speak up and drive change? And I think I would just add to go into what both you guys are saying for most athletes. I think it's just, when I say listening though too, it's opening the conversation and bringing everybody to the table and asking them how they feel, what they feel about it, what they want said, 
no matter what color they are, age they are, background they have. It's just everybody discussing and, and saying how they feel about it and asking each other questions and listening to the other person. I think this is what we're kind of not doing anymore. We're making assumptions about people or we're putting people on one side of the line or the other side of the line rather than listening. Loreda, anything else to add? Yeah, I was just thinking when you said about how you just assume that somebody knows something or, or somebody's going to say something is that we should sit down and listen to each other. And like I said, it's a winner when you said listen. Because if, if we don't listen to each other, how do we know how each other feels? Just because I'm a different color or a different religion, or even made a, maybe an older athlete, you might be assuming just because that person's older, they can't perform as well as you, and they might have the wisdom of the sport and might be able to perform better. They know the tricks of the trade. So you should sit down and discuss with each other how each other is feeling or how they're doing or how they can situate something. But everybody should be treated fair and everybody should be able to come to that table. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, we, so I think we all agree that communication and, and listening is, is key. So now we need to communicate that this panel has gone to an end now that David is here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're on mute, oh, you're David. On. It was a really, really, really interesting pathway through that discussion. We started off with with Mary's statement about this year being an explosion of athlete activism spurred by by Black Lives Matter, of course. And you're right; it has been seen absolutely everywhere across the globe. And then how Ariana sort of mentioned, well, it's not it's not revolutionary, is it? It's just that maybe it's a confluence of circumstances here. And I think the role of social media is significant because I do wonder had not many people seen the footage of exactly how George Floyd lost his life, would it have had the impact that it has done? I, I, I doubt that personally. And I think social media has um, pro propelled those images around the world and it, and it allowed the world as a whole to be aware and to, to react to that. Um, and then, you know, opening the discussion, and I really appreciate it, Ariana, for, for taking that point of view as part of this panel to open the discussion. Um, and, and talking about you know what happens when you raise your voice and who should raise their voice and and why and and the the importance of authenticity, because you know why should someone be pressured to say something that they themselves don't feel and that they don't want to to step forward? It is as as we've all been discussing something that comes inherently with risk and and indeed as you've been discussing more so as as women who who as Steph put it inherently face more risk to be heard to be seen. To be understood and then we got that really really interesting exchange between ariana and mary uh, about i suppose you know this this whole situation opportunity uh, obligation and and listen i mean i think loretta right from the start the way you set the tone with your introduction um the the people expect that on the chat have just been utterly blown away by that um and and just the, the incredible work that you do and and how you know you have represented for your community of of people with with intellectual disability so brilliantly well and and then you know echoing the the thoughts of the others at the end about needing to listen and and that being such a, a key factor in all of this going forward so i you know it perhaps wasn't the the discussion i was expecting but i'm i'm so glad that you all have elicited it it's been absolutely fascinating so many thanks Blank for, for, for taking it on, but also Loretta, Ariana, uh, Mary and Steph, you've, you've all weighed in brilliantly here. So we really, really do appreciate you taking part in what was a, a, an absolutely compelling discussion. Thank you so very much. So that is three down, three to go here on day one of WFS Live. And we're going to be coming straight back uh, with another themed panel. It's uh, in uh, collaboration with Laureus. And we're taking a bit more of an urban look here because we're talking about staying connected, sports role in cities in particular. And that will be starting in oh, just over five minutes time. We'll see you then. <laughs>